everyone. Welcome to another episode of Career Journey Podcast. On today's episode, we have Magarjata Drovniak, or Gosha for short, and she is a linguistics and English professor. She's currently in the English Language Center at Lincoln University in England. And this one was an exciting conversation because if you've ever had a conversation with somebody or met somebody and just instantly knew you should be friends, that you have the same career goals, the same interests, and are very like-minded. That's what happened here. And you can start to notice that a lot towards the end where we get a little bit more familiar. We have the same, almost the same career, just in different countries um, and different subjects, but we are both um, instructors in different ways. And we talk a lot about kind of job security and precariousness. We're both what's called in the US, it's called non-tenure track, um, where we don't necessarily have that job security. And it was really fun to talk about what decisions go into that. What stigma kind of goes into having this type of job or a job without security? And how do you make that decision to go one way or the other? We also got into a lot of the differences in academia, the differences between the US and Europe, we talked about moving for your career. So both of us have moved for our career extensively and Gosha really dives into a move that made her not as happy as she assumed it would be to finding one that did make her happy. So those decisions and that kind of painstaking process of figuring out where you're meant to be and what you're meant to do, we talked at great length of that and what to do when your career doesn't necessarily go as planned. I think both of us had a situation where we had envisioned what we expected our life as professors to be, and that changed through circumstances, through personality, through understanding the career in more depth. It became not really what we wanted, and we wanted something different, and we talk at length about how to navigate that and how to change your plans and change your dreams and figure out really where you want to be. So without further ado, please enjoy Gosha. Hey everyone, welcome to the Career Journey Podcast, where we explore exciting careers and how to get them from the people who flipped it. I'm your host, Dr. Brittany Avila. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, Gosha, to the podcast. So we usually start with a simple question and just looking at, um, did you have any idea of what you wanted to be as a child growing up? Um, I always wanted to teach. So okay. I think I'm one of those people, I, I meet quite a lot of people and many, many people say, I, I didn't know, I changed my mind. And I think many people say that I always wanted to teach. I, yeah. I didn't want to be a ballerina or any other uh, type of career I wanted to teach. It just changed when I grew. So when I was small, I wanted to run a kindergarten. <laughs> and then when right. I was in um, primary school and secondary school, I wanted to become a school teacher. Um, and then I went to university and especially when I was doing my master's, I was thinking, actually, I would really love to teach in higher education. And um, so I always wanted to teach. Uh, it's just the level changed. Um, <laughs> changed with your wanted... development. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So and what type of students I came across. Okay. So, yeah. And was there something that drew you to university teaching at that time when you were getting your master's? You said that you started to navigate towards teaching at college level. Was there something specific that kind of drew you to that age group? Um, it wasn't necessarily about the age group, but about the content, what okay. to teach. So my background is in, um, well, my, my degrees are in linguistics so, mm -hmm. uh, or English studies. So I did linguistics and literature and English language, uh, both British and American literature. So this is sort of my background, but I'm also a qualified EFL teacher, which is English as a foreign language. And you probably refer to it differently in the US, but that, that's how we call it. So. Uh, English language teacher for, for people who are not first language speakers. And, and this is, I was qualified early on in my first degree when I was still in Poland. So I'm originally from Poland. So I started my academic career there. 
And then, um, so this was my plan, go back to school, maybe primary school, secondary school and teach children or, or teenagers English. But then I uh, did my master's and um, I had an opportunity to do a master's in, in UK. Um, and we had a class that was, uh, I don't even remember how it was called, but it was something like academic writing and study skills. And when I had this class, I thought it was super interesting and very useful for me to do my master's dissertation. But also I thought, you know what, this is what I want to teach. <laughs> and this was very, very specific. So uh, in, in UK, especially, we call it EAP, which is English for Academic Purposes. Okay. And I thought, this is what I want to teach. And this decision sort of affected a lot of my choices because, first of all, at the university, this is something that is usually done at university level, college level, university level, because it's English skills for studying uh, academically. And also to stay in the UK, because this is something that you do in the UK or other English language speaking countries for students from other countries who come to study here. So okay. that's, that's how it happened. <laughs> and then if I can go backwards just a little bit, what drew you to studying linguistics in the first place? So you said your plan was to teach English at kind of the primary school level. Was that the guiding force or was there something else about English that kind of drew you? Um, I don't remember the first thing when I was a child, but I always like languages. And mm -hmm. uh, I have a big sister, almost eight years older than me. And I remember when I was a little child and she learned English and I couldn't really understand <laughs> that, you know, she listened to a song in a, in, on the radio and she could understand the words. For me, it was like magic. And then when I grew older, I had the opportunity to learn English and then I learned uh, French and I learned German. My parents were very supportive, so they offered me you know, uh, private tuition as well. And uh, I thought this is easy for me. I, languages are pretty easy for me to absorb. So this is what I was interested in yeah. and I wanted to teach. Now, I don't know how it is in the US, but in, uh, in Poland and in continental Europe, uh, in UK is a bit different, but in, in continental Europe, if you want to teach, you usually get a degree, which is called actually in continental Europe, philology, which okay. is um, linguistics, language, literature, culture, everything together. And within this degree, you qualify as a teacher. So okay. you have different specialisms. You can become a translator or some other specialism, but one part, which is the most popular, is the language teacher. And it could be English philology or French philology or... Spanish philology. So I did English philology. And so this was the, the most obvious route for me to become a teacher. But I also, because I'm a, I'm a real nerd, I love learning. <laughs> I just wanted to learn about language and, you know, study literature as well, learn about in British and uh, American literature. And that's how I ended up in linguistics. And then I, um, in my first degree, the first three years, I always thought, well, linguistics, I have to do it because I need to know about language, but I'm interested in literature because I'm also a big bookworm. So I thought, great, we'll be talking about books. But then soon in, into the degree, I actually thought linguistics is so fascinating, you know, the science of language and how it works. So I still love to read and like literature, but I'm more the linguistic side. Um, and I think it, it helps really in teaching. So that's what I chose. Yeah, I think a lot of us teachers just love to learn. I remember that's how I ended up wanting to be a university teacher was I just wanted to keep learning and stay in college. And I didn't know how else to stay in college without paying a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons for me as well. I just wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. but I, I was afraid that if I stop, I'll forget everything. So yeah, <laughs> definitely true about me as well. <laughs> And so what was that process like going from kind of your college career to your master's career? When did you know that you wanted to go on to a master's? Um, I think I, I knew straight away. And it's also because I come from, from a culture. So it's a bit different now. But when I was going to university, it was 2002. And before that, uh, I think across continental Europe again, um, and not in the UK, is we had five-year degrees. Okay. not bachelor's and master's it was just you got a master's it was a degree and okay. then it kept changing going to BA and then master's so for me it was sort of automatic that I will do my master's um, and I was already in, in in England because I did my third year in London I had this 
coincidental, very by chance uh, opportunity to come to London for my la final year. And I thought, well, I'm already here. I should try to do a master's. So, so I knew straight away that I wanted. Um, at that time, because uh, Poland is in EU, we paid the same amount of fees as UK students. So it's much lower than international. So it was easy financially. Um, and I thought I want to do it. So I started applying to different places um, and got accepted to one that I really wanted to go. And this was quite funny because with my background, I applied to different places. For example, I applied, I think it was University of Edinburgh. And there was one particular master's that I liked. It was more literary. And they actually came back to me and said, you know what, with your background, maybe you want to do a TESOL a master's, which is teaching English as a second language. And I thought, no, I'm already qualified teacher. I want to do something more theoretical or more, you know, linguistic. So I ended up doing master's in very long title, English language and contemporary literary studies. So it was okay. in between linguistics and literature. But yeah, the decision to do it was sort of always there. I didn't think, I didn't have a break. Straight after my uh, finishing my BA, I went to do a master's. And what went into your decision to relocate to the UK to do some of your studies? Um, well, it was uh, it was an accident originally, yeah. and then it was uh, <laughs> then it was uh, well intentional because of my specialism. So originally, I was in the situation where. Uh, I was in Poland and suddenly I had this chance, but, but totally accident, I discovered that you could come to UK and study through through this sort of agent who helped. So I dropped her an email and she said, oh yeah, I could put you on a year three in this university. And that's what I did. Okay. And I was for a year in London. Um, it was seen as beneficial because I studied in Poland for three years and it everything was in English. So the language of instruction was in English, but... I was not immersed in English, right? So I, I lacked fluency. And this was this thing that you, you, your English is not as fluent, as, as natural as it could be if you are in a country using English. So it was always an opportunity to be immersed. And then I went, I was for a year in London. And actually I wasn't very happy there because London is very big and, you know, I was overwhelmed. So I was thinking, oh, no, I'm definitely going back. At this point, I was thinking, I'm going back to Poland to study, to teach in a secondary school. I just do it and go. It would look nice on my CV. But then I thought, you know what? I could do a master's one more year, and then this would make my CV look amazing. Right? Yeah. So, so that's what I did. And then I did my master's, which I did at a different university in Lancaster. Um, and I did my dream master's and this was probably academically the best year of my life. And I just oh, thought, yeah. I don't want to leave anymore. Maybe not academic, well, everything academically and meeting people and, you know, learning new things. And I just thought, right. this is what I want to do. And when I did, like I mentioned um, a bit earlier, when I did have this class where I thought, this is what I want to teach, EIP and study skills. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the decision, actually, I would need to stay here. And I already felt that I'm sort of settling in more in the UK than going back to Poland. And did, so that's how it happened. Did that decision feel a little surprising to you? Did it kind of sneak up on you that you were wanting to stay or was it kind of a gradual realization? Um, I think it was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> yeah, because, because I, I still remember this feeling in London when I said, no, no, I have to survive this year and go back because I'm not really happy. And then I did this extra year and then I thought, actually, it's great. And it's probably a lot to do what I was learning. So I had some amazing modules and amazing lectures. And I was thinking, I, I want to keep on going and learning. And so then I thought, I, I just want to stay. And how would I be able to stay? Well, I could do a PhD. That's what, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, but I didn't have money. And I wasn't sure what to do, but I didn't want to go back to Poland. But I was thinking, I want to stay because I want to continue learning as a, as a nerd. <laughs> so so that's, that's what happened. Nice. And then how did you make that work? So did you end up going on to a PhD or did you get a job right away to help finance things? Where'd you uh, go next? The, the latter, yes. So, <laughs> so I couldn't go on. Um, at this point, again, we're talking not very high fees because it was home fees and for PhD it was compared to what PhD paid now. 
and it was a much lower fee, so much more affordable, but I still didn't have them. Yeah. So what I did is I thought, well, I'm going to go and work and try to uh, earn some money and maybe come back. At this point, I didn't know if I would be able to go back to, to, to study. But I was really desperate not to go back to Poland. It was this thing, this would be going back. So I actually ended up uh, going for a year to Spain to teach okay. English. Yeah. Wow. And, um, it was, it was, again, another big coincidence because on our website about careers, so careers for students at our university, which you might have an equivalent at your university, mm -hmm. there was an advert. We need, you know, English language teacher. And they actually specifically wanted someone with no experience because they used a very specific um, teaching method, which they didn't want someone to be traditional and have taught in a different way. They just wanted someone to learn this new way. Okay. And so uh, it was very, very short timing. So I think I was submitting my, my master's August. So I had to come back to England, submit it because I was for a couple of months at home. And then I saw this advert, sent them an email and they said, fine, you can come, but you need to be there on the 1st of September. So it was oh, like wow. 10 days. <laughs> and that's what I did. So I went back to Poland, packed up, went to Spain and the deal was that I was staying with a local family. So they provided me bed and board and uh, they had, the, the mother was an English teacher and um, the, the deal was that I would also teach them. So we will talk all English. And they had three daughters, um, nine, 11 and 14 at that time. Um, and uh, I also taught in a school and I also taught individual students. So there's lots of different things that I taught and I was there from September to June, so whole school year. Wow. And, and it was really fun. But by, by the end of it, I said, I need to go back to study because I'm <laughs> forgetting and I'm teaching you know, beginners English, which, which is very rewarding as well, but I want to go back to university. Yeah. So. Okay, so then at the end of that time period, did you go straight back to university? Uh, almost, um, because um, I wanted to, uh, again, continue working. Mm -hmm. So I applied for PhDs um, and was waiting for some news. Uh, I applied to the same place that I did my master's. Okay. So they already knew me because also the specialism that I did. And what I did, I started applying for something that we call, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in the US, but we call precessional courses which are summer academic English courses for students who have to improve English before they join university. Uh, okay. Yeah. We call them remedial courses. Yeah. So, so this is the, the type of course. Um, and um, you remember when I told you um, when I did my master's and I wanted to, to teach this particular thing, I actually contacted my teachers from that course and said, I would love to teach it. What do I need to do to, to get into this? And she said, you know what, the, the permanent positions are difficult to find, uh, but it's easy to get into those summer courses and then you get experience on your CV. Okay. So that's what I did. I got, uh, I got a eight week course in one of the universities in UK. So I actually went back to Poland, we packed, went back to, to England for those eight weeks. And this was a great experience, lots of good friends as well. And then I started my PhD actually in November that year. Okay. So, so I was sort of collecting, collecting my money for, for saving my money for, for the tuition fees. And I ended up going back there to the same place. I did it three times, three summers, because it was a good sort of summer job, intense teaching for eight weeks, but very well paid. So Nice. And then what was it, what was the experience like of getting your PhD? Was it as exciting as kind of that second year of your master's or was it more difficult it was it was difficult <laughs> it, it, it was hard and um, I guess it, it depends on on your personality I guess and also on um, I don't know what your experience was but the or personality but also on the project so mm -hmm. I think if it's very very finite and you're doing things like interviews or labs it's it's much more structured Whereas mine was on text. So from day one, I had my data, but it was just very vague because my methodology went everywhere because I was yeah. trying to 
do different things. So it was difficult. The first year probably was the most exciting for me because it was literature review. So I was just reading and making notes. It was very exciting. I, I love this. Yeah. But it was, it was difficult. I found it difficult. It was good because there were lots of uh, fellow students. So um, again, I don't know what, what the reality is in the US, but we had quite a lot. I, I did my PhD in a department that is usually in the top three of linguistic departments in the country. Yeah. And they have loads of PhD students. So there's lots of people which had offices. You, you know, there were lots of meetings for research groups. So it was very uh, sort of very uh, familial mm -hmm. um, or collegial. But uh, but yeah, it was difficult. I think the longer it went, it it was more difficult to because yeah. you have to be told when to stop. And I was very lucky. I had very good uh, supervisors, very supportive, and from two different departments. Um, but yeah, it was hard. So what happened with me is in the UK, normally PhD will last three to four years. Okay. I think it's, it's a bit different in the US. But here it's three to four years if it's by research only because there are other options. So you just start, focus on your PhD, finish three to four years. It took me five years. So <laughs> I can confess. <laughs> And uh, a lot to do with self-funding. So I wasn't funded. So you could get a scholarship, but this is very difficult to get in, in yeah. UK. Um, and sometimes it's just funded for fees and you also need money for life. Yeah. I, I didn't have any. So what I did is I, I did the, sum, the summer courses to, to help uh, me. And then I also worked throughout. So it delayed me a bit. Absolutely. But what it helped me with is my current career <laughs> because um, I knew from a friend of mine that there would be need for teachers in EIP so academic English uh, on campus there was a, a there was a small center private provider attached to the university that run international foundation program and I started working there in, in my second year of my PhD okay. so I did around 10 hours a week 10 sometimes 15 hours a week of teaching um, so it helped me survive and, and pay my fees, but also great teaching experience. So. Great. And then what was your next step once you finally finished that PhD? Where'd you go after that? Uh, I, before I started, before I finished, I started applying for jobs. And, mm -hmm. and again, the market is not great and it's worse now. But when, when I finished, mm -hmm. I finished... Well, I submitted in 2013, so we're talking almost eight years. Um, I was applying for a lot of jobs and I didn't get anywhere. So it was quite quite depressing, really difficult. And here, at least here, the, the process is very time consuming. So I spent hours filling in online forms, boxes. Yeah. And yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's intense. Yeah, yeah so... Um, so at this point, I think uh, I was thinking I would like to become a lecturer in my specialism. I think okay. most of my uh, friends from P doing a PhD, this was something that we all wanted. Mm -hmm. I had to get a finish and within the specialism, so with this, this area of linguistics, I specialize, get a, get a lectureship. And it, it was really difficult. And um, most of us were just applying, applying, and nothing happened. Some of my... Uh, friends got lectureships I didn't get anywhere with this so what happened I was thinking well I need to try for something else and I actually got a job after my PhD even before I sub submitted so I was pretty lucky in this sense which was in academic study skills so it was basically what I've been teaching all along but nice. it wasn't linked and I got this so I actually got it uh, in September and I submitted in October um, and I had my um, um, viva or defense, as you call it, in December. So I, I sort of hurried to submit. Um, and this job, this job was good, a very good experience, but it wasn't in what I studied for my PhD. But right. it was really great because it was permanent, well paid at a university. Um, and I was there for four years. Um, okay. But yeah, and then, then I moved on somewhere else. So, so it was really good from this point of view. You know, I'm not, I wasn't starving. I was, I was having a really <laughs> good job. It wasn't the lectureship I was dreaming of. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so how did you end up leaving that position and going somewhere else? Well, 
Um, at this point, I was thinking maybe um, I, I can still have a chance to, to get uh, this lectureship. And I, I, I was trying to apply for different places. And um, it was also thinking about what sort of, uh, what, what do I want and uh, what sort of atmosphere I want in work. And I think in this particular place, I was thinking maybe it's not the best fit for me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started looking for other jobs. Um, and I, and for a long time, I was applying for lectureships. And again, I didn't get anywhere. Um, and I think the reason for it is that, uh, at least here, for lectureship, you need to have lots of publications. I'm more yeah. dedicated to teaching rather than to uh, writing for publications. So that was my problem. I, I lacked that. So I couldn't say, here's the long list of my uh, articles, <laughs> unfortunately. And I got to the point that I was thinking, okay, I'm not getting anywhere with this. What I'm going to do is reshuffle my priorities, rethink what I can do. Because uh, I didn't want to be really down and thinking, well, you know, you can either think I'm a failure because I never got to where I wanted to be, or you can do something else. So I sat down and thought, you know, the typical plus and minus or some notes. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, what do I want? What are my skills? What am I good at? So I was thinking, well, I want to stay in higher education somehow. I want to have contact with students in some capacity. I'm really good at teaching. I'm good at working with international students. I have other skills. And once I planned this and thought what sort of jobs I could apply for, which were in the lectureships, it was all about working with international students, teaching them academic English or study skills or some other. I started applying and then I started getting interviews. Okay. So I got another job after that, after those four years at another big university where I was um, teaching uh, international foundation again. So this is like year zero before degree. Mm -hmm. um, and that was great, but it was fixed term um, contracts. So it was, this was actually scary. And I think this is something also to consider for your students. It's scary going from a permanent contract to, and I had two year contract, but yeah. I thought it was worth it, but it was very stressful. <laughs> it is, <know>? yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you don't know whether you'll get an extension or, or you have to look again. And so when I was getting closer to the end of this contract, I was thinking, well, maybe this, again, I wasn't thinking, I was thinking maybe this is not the best fit for me. Is there another um, opportunity that would be better? So this meant lots of moving around uh, England, yeah. probably. It sounds not, not so big because it's a small country in comparison, but it was. And then I ended up where I am now. And it turned out to be the best fit. So I'm, I'm really happy. But it's still focused on my skills and on working with international students and not necessarily exactly what I did in my PhD. Okay. But and then everything, you know, comes together and I'm using the skills from PhD here. So, yeah. Nice. And what do you do in your current position? So I, I work at a smaller university um, and I, um, I am a manager. So it's a more a managerial position. Okay. I run an English language center, which is a unit that is um, supporting international students. So we, we teach um, academic English, but I have a bit more responsibility because I'm not a teacher, I manage a team. So I'm, I'm the boss, <laughs> but I also <laughs> teach, <laughs> I also teach. So, so we are a small team um, and it's sort of like a central unit within a university for all students across university. And I think, this is for my skills and my interests is probably the best fit. Um, and I don't know what will happen in 10 years time, but currently it's the it's right. best fit because it's, it's more about communication and networking. So I work very closely with lots of um, people across universities. So I talk to people in different departments in different schools about their students and what we can do for them. Uh, sort of exchanging ideas, maybe advising if they ask for advice, organizing uh, special courses for their students. So it, it's just trying to be helpful to everyone, but it's, it's a lot about communication and networking. And I think I enjoy this element very much. And is this one a permanent position or is this also a temporary? It contract? is permanent, yes. So I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm settled here and I hope I stay here for, for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I know I moved around a lot as well when I was doing my PhD. And so having a place that feels a little bit more settled is a new feeling and it's a great one. So it glad. is. And I hope, I hope you feel like this now. 
it, it took me five and a half years to get here. And I always tell people that, at least my experience is that it, it probably most likely is not the first thing that you get after your PhD or your degree. It's because you're also learning what you want, what, what skills you have and what you're actually enjoying. So today I'm thinking, actually, I don't think lectureship would be the, the best option for me, even mm -hmm. if I got offered it, because what I am enjoy is what I'm doing now. And, and I don't have the pressure of you have to publish, you have to do this. Yeah. Um, I'm also in a different position because I'm not in an academic contract. So we have two parts to university. And again, I don't know how in the US it works. Mm -hmm. We have professional services and we have academic, uh, what you would call faculty, academic yeah. contracts. So, so lectures would be on academic contracts. I have a different contract which is a bit different. So I don't have the research in my contract, for example, but I have fixed hours of work <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and, you know, the, lots of things that I, I really treasure right. compared to the previous uh, positions. So five o'clock finish and that's it nice. when, I, when I end my work. <laughs> and oh. yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I think, so if, if any of your, your listeners are thinking about it, about careers and what happens, it's it's probably useful to think that maybe the first one is not the the best fit. It's just the first step, and then you're learning on. I, I'm now thinking that I had to go through all of this to appreciate what I'm having now, and I sometimes sound very over enthusiastic when I say how much I love my job, but it's because I learned on in my previous positions there were lots of things that made right. me you know, frustrated or not very happy. And then I appreciate what I have now, which is, which is useful, you know, this experience. Yeah. And I really like that advice because there's a lot of careers, especially with my field in psychology, where some of the jobs in psychology, you can't get hands-on experience until you've already gone through like yeah. college and licensing and certain things. And without that experience, just like you're saying, it's difficult to know for sure. So even in academia, I knew I wanted to be a college professor, but in the US, there's a lot of different ways to be a college professor. So we have the same thing. We have faculty and then we have like administration is what we call it. Um, but even within faculty, we have a lot of different varieties. So we have like the permanent jobs, which we call tenure track, which are what you're saying, the same thing as the lecturer in the UK, where it's a really intense publication process. You have to have a very long publication list. It's getting more and more intense every year, where now to be entering the job market, you need the same amount of publications that people used to need to get tenure. It's insane. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. and so it's, it's a really difficult process. And then I was the same exact way as you. I really wanted to focus more on teaching. Like I like research, um, but I don't want to do that whole like publish or perish mindset where you have to have all these publications. And so I had to go more of the teaching route. And here in the U S that means no secure employment. So if you're doing the teaching route, they're all what we call non tenure track in some variety. And so they're all precarious. They're not permanent positions essentially. Now, or short term. Yeah. And there's some variety. Mine is actually really special where my job is permanent in the sense that they'll keep me as long as they can. Um, they don't want me to leave essentially as long as I'm doing my job, but if funding runs out, if something happens, if, they need to move funding somewhere else, then it's gone. Whereas with those tenure track permanent positions, that's less likely to happen. So, um, and then we have some other positions that are very short term, like semester by semester basis. And people are usually working at multiple universities and it's really difficult. And that's something that you, I heard about in college and during my PhD, but I didn't really know until I got onto the job what it really looked like and what it really meant, right? So when you're idealistic and you're in a PhD and you're just hoping for a job, you're like, I don't care that it pays less money. I don't care that it's not permanent. It's a job. I'll take it. And then you get into it and all of a sudden it's, it's a different <laughs> feeling. Yeah, definitely. And he, here yeah. it's, it, it's very similar. So I, I say in all my career now, I, I'm so lucky because I, I had this 
security in a way, even if it was fixed term. I know so many people and lots of my friends that I did PhD with, they ended up doing, like you say, and it's not even semester by semester, but it's just hourly paid. So you do two hours here, three hours here, travel across counties and towns to get to a different university. Um, and it's, it's, it's really difficult, but there's, there's uh, just not enough permanent jobs. And this is something, and I think I mentioned it to you when, when, we, when we wrote, that this is something I'm really passionate about now because I want PhD students to know that there are other options and they don't right. need to go through all this. Um, I know that when I started my PhD, we actually had some um, the f workshops to advise us on job search and, and uh, CVs. So I remember we had a session on academic CVs, but this was, I would say, my first or second year. So let's say 10 years ago. Um, and I remember we were told, well, you need publication, but you really need teaching experience as well. So you need to get this. Hmm. Um, and I was thinking, yes, I'm teaching. So this will count that I keep teaching at a higher level, <laughs> but it doesn't count. At this point, oh. at least here, it's publications. And also now they want uh, grant, applic grant applications to yes. show that you've applied for grants. And I don't think teaching experience matters so much, at least from my experience on those right. applications. So, so it, it is difficult um, to think, you know, how, how it would work. And, but at the same time, I think it, it, it's really important for students to know when they're still studying, but it's not black and white, at least I think so. And I, I can hear that your, your situation is similar, that there are other options and you can be fulfilled and use your PhD, you're using a PhD. Mm -hmm. And I feel I use quite a lot, although I'm not teaching this in a you know lecture theater necessarily. Yeah. So, so I actually started working with. We have a unit called the Doctoral School that actually supports PhD students, and I started working with them. Um, and at the moment, I just deliver workshops for international students, so it's language, so I teach them. But I'm hoping that in the future I'll be able to be more involved with like career days and things like that. I offered oh, nice. to them, you know, if they wanted someone to talk about work like mine, I would be happy to do it. Just to say, you know, it's not if you don't get a lectureship, then you complete failure. It's not true. And you can do lots of different things, either completely outside of academia or what I do, I, I feel like I'm, I think there's sometimes term para-academic mm -hmm. in the middle. Um, that you're not fully, but you're still in the middle. And I think there, there's, you know, it depends what you'd like to do, but I think yeah. you can find your place in a situation, in, in a context like this. And it's important for people to know it, but, you know, th there's other options. And it might be that this is not what you thought, like what I did. I had to reinvent myself saying, okay, I'm not getting there. So I will I'll sit down and cry and say, I'm done because I'm a failure. Or I think I have lots of things to offer. I have all this other part of me with all this teaching experience and I'm going to use this. Yeah. And th this is what I did because I, I wanted to do something more positive rather than sit down and cry. <laughs> well, and sometimes it's about shaking off other people's perceptions too. So I had the same experience in that really in our graduate programs, it's pushed and expected that you're going to go into the equivalent of the lectureships. So, so our mm -hmm. kind of tenure track jobs. Yeah. And when I realized when I was getting close to the job market, I didn't really want to be in that position. I didn't want, you know, I, I wanted to be a professor and I wanted the title and I wanted the money that came along with it, but I didn't want to spend my days applying to grants and doing only research and having teaching kind of be secondary and being trying to get out of teaching every once in a while. I really wanted to be more student centered. I wanted to be teaching. I wanted, I didn't know I wanted advising at the time, but now I definitely do because I want to be around the students. And so I knew that going to these kind of non tenure track jobs was something that I wanted, but it was almost like I had to be quiet about it. Like I, I didn't want to, I told people I was still applying to the other types of jobs because there was this stigma around that it was kind of less than or that I was failing and I wasn't really doing what I wanted and I, but it was exactly what I wanted. And so I like mm -hmm. your advice of figuring out, like, I really liked how you mentioned that you kind of sat down with yourself and said, what are my skill sets? What do I like? And what type of jobs could I apply to 
cater to those because that's really the point, right? Is finding out yeah. what do you like, what is your skill set, and where can you go? And sometimes that means breaking free of kind of this societal structure, if you will, yeah. of what you yeah, should be yeah. doing. I think I think you're so right, and it's it's wonderful to hear because I think we're so alike. So <laughs> yeah. glad I have met you. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's. I think you're very right. And I was always thinking about this in restraints within yourself, expectations. This is what you want, but you're so right. And it reminded me of something when I was uh, still doing my PhD, and we met with all those friends. They we were connected by the, what we did in our PhD, but we we're in different departments. And I remember some of them. I don't think they did it on purpose, but they looked down on me because I was yeah. teaching foundation students. I wasn't teaching, I was still teaching in my department, but it wasn't, I did some undergraduate teaching as well, but it was, oh, you're doing this because, you know, they, they're not real students. They, 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 <laughs> that's how I felt that yeah. maybe that, that they looked down on me, but that's what I was doing. And then when I got my job after my PhD, on one hand, everyone said, it's brilliant. You got a permanent job even before you submitted and it's well paid and you have everything. But on the other, all the other friends were get well, not all, but many of them were getting lectureships. And even if it was, you know, like you said, a short term, for me, it was the grass is greener on their side, right? Because they, right. Also, they got a lectureship and I, I didn't and I'm, I'm not so good. And then the a lot changed when I was talking to one of my supervisors and uh, we, we, we met in a conference and she was catching up with all our, uh, all, all her supervisees and we're still in touch because we're quite friendly. And she told me, you know what? I always thought about you as my success story. You're my success story. <laughs> when, when I sometimes think about what I'm doing to, to, to cheer myself up, I always think about it because yeah. she said, you're my success story. All the other students, when I started talking to them, they were all unhappy because they said this pressure, this pressure, short-term contract. And and I never thought about it like this. So I think you're so right about breaking free of those expectations from outside and inside and actually thinking, what do I want to do and what can I offer? Yeah, yeah. definitely. And it's amazing how powerful someone else's validation of you can be. I was talking about this the other day that sometimes we don't know that we're a success or that we are, you know, making headway. Like I am in the very beginning of my career and I am trying to build what I want my career to be. And I was having a really hard time and I was just like, I'm a failure. I'm not doing what I should be doing. I, all these things I've been trying to do are not working. I'm not seeing any return on them. I don't know what I'm doing. And then I was a guest on someone else's podcast and they were like, oh, this is how I view your career. And it was just so refreshing to hear it from somebody else where it was like, oh, okay, maybe I am doing like somebody is noticing it is getting a return. I just can't see it or things like that. And I know a lot of students think when you get the PhD, all that fear and anxiety goes away. Like the imposter syndrome goes away, right? I have a PhD. Now I'm smart. Now I'm capable. Now I can do everything. And I naively thought that was the case too. I was like, I'm going to go get a PhD and then I could write books because I'll be smart enough and people will take me seriously. And then you realize, oh no, this is just human condition. We still have it kind of all the way through. Yeah. Although it, it even grows later because you keep thinking, well, I have a PhD, I should know this. Yeah. I think it took me in, in my career, it took me several years and I've been teaching what I'm teaching since since 2008 so it's almost 13 years now and I think mm -hmm. like I'm, I really know what I'm doing but it only probably the last three years three three and a half years I suddenly thought people see me as an expert it's not right. like me <laughs> pretending that I know what I'm doing it's actually they know that I know and they asked me as an expert and I it was it was this validation that you didn't realize. Yeah. Which, which, and in my position now, that's, that's what I appreciate in my job, but I do get called by people across university to, to help them or just advise them or just suggest something. And it says, yeah, I, I'm an expert, but, but obviously imposter syndrome always sits there yeah. for all of us. Well, cause it's such a gradual process. Like you were saying, it's taken about eight years for you to actually start recognizing that you're an expert yeah. when you probably we're an expert, you know, a year two in. And so it's more of a gradual process. We think it's like a lightning bolt. Like all of a sudden one day we're going to get rid of imposter syndrome and we're going to keep going. And 
I don't think it ever goes away. I haven't heard anyone say that they don't have it. So, yeah. Do you find it that in, in what you're doing now, there is certain freedom? Because I, I have it. Yeah, you yes. agree? Yeah, it's one of the things I like best about my job because in this system, so I'm at a research intensive university as well. So our department and our university, their main priority, I wouldn't say their main priority, but like the biggest priority is research output. So publications, all of that. Um, and I'm in a really unique research university that actually still values teaching. I've heard a lot of horror stories that most research intensive universities kind of let teaching go at the wayside and R still values it, but it's very clear distinction that we, you know, are not quite as valued as that research. We don't make as much money. We don't have that security and permanent position. They also don't watch over us really. Um, so there's not a, as much oversight, if you will, like they're not paying as much attention as long as students are being taught, as long as the, tenure tracks teachers don't have to teach as many classes. They're usually fine. Um, and I found an immense amount of freedom in that where I can try new things and I can go based off of the research on teaching and learning and, and reorganize things and kind of try different things. Right now I'm creating a system to help um, train our graduate students in teaching because our graduate students are so focused on research, they don't have enough time to take an additional class geared towards teaching. Um, but our department luckily was like, it's still important that they know some of these things of teaching. We can't give you a whole class, but could you design like a two day workshop for them? You know, and so I get this type of freedom. Um, and that part, I mean, that's I think what I was looking for in not doing that kind of tenure track lectureship type of career is that I wanted more of this freedom. I wanted more work-life balance. I get that a lot more. Um, so yeah, I've definitely noticed the, yeah. the freedom yeah, aspect so, in it. Yeah, it, it's great to to, uh, to hear it, and especially from such a different context, because I, I've been telling people about this, and, and I actually still find myself, maybe it's just my personal experience, but or personal impression, and people don't see it like this, but I still feel that I have to defend what I'm doing because yeah. I'm not on a lecture contract, right? The people who just see lectureship or nothing, uh, they see it as a sort of like a lesser option because I, yeah. uh, although I, I love what I'm doing. So I feel like I, I probably need to defend it, but I found lots of freedom. So first work-life balance because I have, you know, fixed hours and no one expects me to uh, reply to emails at 10 p.m. or, or work over weekend. In teaching, we have quite a lot of freedom because we are a central unit. Mm -hmm. So we're not really constrained by uh, constraints of degree programs and rules about what can be done, what can't be done. We don't really have, uh, the summer courses are uh, assessed by the ones we offer throughout the year, they're not assessed. So we, we just offer what uh, is useful for students and we can change it all the time. And I, I love it. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is about about research, what I found, which was unexpected because my previous two jobs, I was teaching only. It was academic contract teaching only. And anytime I wanted to do some research, it was like, we don't care because you're teaching <laughs> only. So you can do it in your own time. That's it. Or you can, we can give you money for a conference if it's linked to your job. Yeah. Whereas my research interests are not necessarily what I do in my job. So or sometimes. Whereas where I'm now, I'm not even an academic contract, but actually I have very supportive uh, manager and everyone is very supportive. If you want to do this, it's useful, do it. And I'm actually doing research. Yeah. Some of it is linked to my teaching or some mode of practice scholarship, but some is not. And, and it's the first time I actually have freedom to do it, which is very surprising. I was very surprised that I could do it in, in such a job. So. So yeah, there's a lot, but, but again, when you look at it, what it is, the title and how you end up in a position like that, you think necessarily, you don't think necessarily that you would have this freedom and, and you find it, right? And actually you value it. So that, that's really great. Yeah, definitely. I, I noticed that same stigma where I feel like when I tell people my position, the immediate assumption is that I failed at research or that I wasn't good enough. And so I went into this position and a lot of us don't. I think a lot of people in this position go into this one for the love of teaching 
And just like you're saying, the freedom of being able to kind of do more what we want without having these limitations on us. And so I like hearing it from someone else as well. I feel like we need to get rid of this stigma a little bit and realize that there's different ways to use your PhD and not one's necessarily better than the other. Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think this is really important and to, to share this message. I've been, you know, following, you've probably seen on Twitter, there's quite a lot of people who sort of promote jobs outside of academia, going into mm-hmm. industry. But for me, it's also this other extreme because sometimes we say, oh, you know, you'll be better off in the industry. You don't have to stay in academia. Yeah. But I'm sort of in between that if you can still be in academia if you want, but there's still other roles that could be even more fulfilling than what you think a, a lectureship or tenure track is. And I think those three things should, should be sort of val- bo- on the same level of being valid, right? Yeah. You can be fully academic, you can be sort of in between like we are, and you can go to industry and still use your PhD and be fulfilled, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I know we're coming up on time. So my last question I usually ask is if you had kind of one major piece of advice you would give to anyone starting out in a career or changing careers, what would be your kind of biggest or best piece of advice? Oh, this, this is a tricky one. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say don't be afraid of change because change is good. Um, and don't, in the sense that change is good and don't sell yourself short. So if you're somewhere and you're not happy, you know, find a job and you're not happy and you think this is not what you want, but this is what I've expected me to do. Don't, don't do it. Just change. Try to change. Uh, change is good. And even if you have to try different things, uh, then it will probably lead you to a place where you actually find the best fit. So don't be afraid of that to explore what you could do and, and yeah, embrace change. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Career Journey Podcast. Head over to our website at careerjourneypodcast.com for more information and the latest episodes. See you next time.